if I have to fish, I go to a lake and I start out, and actually let's just back up a little bit. I start out by going to a lake, and I don't even take my rods out of the car. The very first thing I do is I walk down, towards the water, nice and softly, and I say, I'm just going to relax for a minute, and I'm going to take it in. So I can hear myself. I just want to take it in. I kind of get a feel for how the lake is this day. Because lakes, some days the fish are aggressive, some days they're quiet. I'll just walk up, lean up against a tree, or, you know, just kind of stand nice and still. A little back. I want to see, am I seeing ripples today? Am I hearing splashes? Am I seeing <coughs> insect life on the surface? Is the lake alive? Or is the lake dead today? And that's going to determine whether I'm going to fish it aggressively, or fish the lake passively, a little slower a little more quiet. The other thing is, you know when you launch a boat or when you first go down and fish, every lake's got those couple open spots, right? Fish sense you coming. They can feel you through the ground as you walk close to it. You can prove this. Get out of your car, walk on down right to the lake. Ten yards before you get to the edge, what do you see? See there's these bee wakes all moving off, right? They feel you before they even come. So my first cast, once I've taken this in, before I put a boat in or a kayak, before I start to wade, my first cast is about from here to the wall, right in front the place that I like to stand. And I'll work some small lure or some quiet lure in that and just see. You'd be amazed how many times the biggest fish I pick up in the course of the day is that very first cast of the morning to the spot where I was just going to put my boat in. Okay? The reason for that is people come down, they drag their kayaks, they get in and out of the water, they wade, they launch their boat, they're moving around in that one little area, they're shuffling, they're kicking up the sand, they're kicking up the mud a little bit, the weeds are cleared from that place because there's traffic, and the fish could be just in a circle around it. Guys get out of the boat, they throw their bait back in the lake sometimes, there's always something kind of to feed or hold the small fish around, the bigger fish sense that. So one of the best places to work in a weedy lake is right where you put in, right where you first start casting, but you want to approach it nice and slow. Now, once I get out on the water, as I said, not all weeds are created equal. I look for lily pads first once we're in season and they're up, okay? I always look for lily pads first. doesn't mean I'll fish them first, but I'll make a mental note where my lily pads are. And the next thing I'm looking for are deadfalls or any type of wood that's in the water. There's tons of structure in our lakes. They range from shopping carts you know, to the concrete blocks to sunken rowboats, okay? If it's in there on the bottom, it'll hold fish at some point. But the single best thing for bass, for pickerel especially, for panfish if you enjoy catching panfish, is anything that's wood. And, more specifically, any wood that's natural and not pressure treated. So, um, logs are much preferable to fence posts, let's say, if you find them in there. That natural wood holds more life around, that untreated wood. Well, it's lots of little, um, you know, worms and little snails and all sorts of stuff to cling to that. And the smaller fish come to feed on that. And the bigger fish, who are going to gravitate towards structure anyway, are going to tra gravitate towards the structure that holds the more small fish. So I like to look specifically for any type of wood. So I'm looking for lily pads, dead falls in wood. And then I start looking at how are the weeds laying on this particular lake. So I'm talking mostly in this instance, we're talking mostly bass fishing. Okay? You have a nice long bank of weeds, and you can see it, okay? Comes out from the shore, runs about, you know, third out into the lake, cuts and goes down, nice and smooth, looks really good, looks really inviting. You know the fish are going to be near the weeds, but you need to break it down. You need to micro-fish the weeds. So I take a section of the weeds, any section, and I say, in that section of weeds, where is this particular structure or the changes in that? So I start looking for places that aren't straight and long, I'm looking for pockets in the weeds where it kind of makes a tiny cove, or a point of the weeds that sticks out a little bit more, or spots where the weeds take a turn. Okay? Any change, that's what we, when we talk about structure, structure is change in the bottom or change in, change in an area that you're working. Any change in the weeds is the places that you want to cast to, the places you want to work the most. So, if you have a nice long straight edge, that's fine, it's a good starting place, but now focus in any place that it changes. And the reason is, you got a point that comes out of weeds, okay, let's say, and a little pocket in there, and this long straight thing. Coming out to that point, big fish have to move around it, or they have to go through it and come back out into open water, the big fish will set up on both sides of that. If you have a little cold in the weeds, a little indentation, the bass will back into that, and it'll wait for something just to swim back across. You ever watch a sunny, by the 
goes, sitting on his desk even, right? He backs up, he stops for a second, he turns and he goes, right? Then he circles on back, give him a couple minutes, he'll be right back in the same spot. Bass and the leaves are the exact same thing. Bass and sunfish belong to the same family, okay? They act very, very much the same. Learn to catch sunfish, you can learn to catch bass. It's, it's learn to watch sunfish because they're easier to observe, and you get a good idea of how bass work, okay? So bass will do the same thing. They'll get in the weeds, and they'll back up, down one of those little channels, we said, and they'll just look for a spot where it comes right across, and they're waiting there to jump out. Now, how big can, how big a bait can it be? Bass grab. That's kind of a, an interesting question too. They'll eat the biggest thing that they can get their mouth around. Anybody here striper fish? Right. So, you, know, you, you check a real big bait sometimes. Same thing on large guys. They find bigger baits equate to bigger fish. Smaller baits equate to small, more action. The thing is, if you use a bait that's large enough, you can catch plenty of big fish instead of catching plenty of small fish. So I tend to go small lures early in the spring, but bigger and bigger throughout the season. And what I'm trying to do is, is just put a big presentation in front of that fish. Um, they have to be really particular. They can eat one big meal, I think, and be done for a day. Right? Or they can pick a particular type of bait that they want to jump on, focus on that, and they only want that. But they can eat big baits. So those trap that the DEC puts in that we all love to catch, that's bass candy. Okay? I, when I was younger, I haven't kept freshwater fish in years. But when I was younger, I used to keep them, cut them open to see, you know, quite to see what they were um, feeding on. I found trout in there. I found panfish. Last year, I took a four-pound smallmouth up in Connecticut. It had, uh, it was, I didn't catch it. Um, I saw it floating on the surface. And it was, you know, bopping around. So I went over, I netted it. It had a nine-inch sunfish stuck in its throat with the pins and the dorsal fins stuck straight up. So it was vertical in the fish's throat. That is a nine-inch, nine-inch um, panfish for a smallmouth bass, which has a ma mouth much smaller than a large mouth. And the fish was only this big. Okay, fish can eat large things. Over at Connecticut Park, in fact, when they were releasing the trout out of the park uh, because they had the uh, IPN disease a few years ago, I went down to check it out and, and watch it get released. And they had stopped feeding the fish in the pens by that point, and the fish were beginning to cannibalize each other. So I go over, I look, and I see there's a dead 10-inch rainbow floating on the surface. And he's in the pool of fish that are 10 to 14 inches. Okay? So I said to the guy that you know, was working there, I said, oh, you got a floater. He goes, oh, don't worry, they'll eat it. And I'm thinking to myself, how are those trout going to eat it? You know, the 14 inches, how are they going to eat a 10-inch fish? Especially trout, you know, rainbows don't have big teeth. They're not going to tear it to shreds. Sure enough, after about 10 minutes, that float is up here. He's 10 inches long. A 14-inch rainbow came and grabbed him by the nose. And he took him a half inch at a time over 20 minutes. So when I was leaving, 20 minutes later, that whole 10-inch trout was inside the 14-incher with about that much of the tail sticking out. And the 14-incher was swimming around like this. <laughs> but he was stuck, right? So if a dainty trout that's 14 inches long, can swallow a 10-inch uh, you know, trout. Just imagine what a bass or a pickerel that's built to eat you know, bigger stuff can do. You know, they're, they're, they're eating small um, muskrats. They're eating, they're eating snakes. They're eating anything that swims across. They're eating those big giant moths that land on the water sometimes, butterflies, grasshoppers. And they're eating the biggest fish in the lake that they can get their mouths around. They don't eat the fish from bass with real small stuff. The big stuff is really big. Back to the weeds. We're looking at um, we're looking at points. We're looking at coves, right? Most people go in and they say, "Okay, I got my spot here. It's a little pocket. It looks real good. There's a stump there, so I, I got I got structure. I got the weeds at the same time, so I'm building these factors in my favor." The first cast you throw shouldn't be where you think you're going to hit a home run, because what happens is the smaller bass are more aggressive than the bigger fish. Okay? So bigger fish, if they want it, the game's over. They'll just take it. But most of the time, those fish are kind of neutral, hanging around. They probably ate last night, let's say. You know, and they're fairly full. You have to work them up. So I'll start by making my first cast. Say if I wanted to cast to the board here, I'm going to throw my first cast right around here, five or six yards away from my primary target. And the reason is, let's say I'm using a small twitch bait or something, a little Rapala, um, you know, or a Rebel, or, you know, Something similar to the Missouri Crystal Minnow. If I twitch that once or twice, first thing that's going to jump on that is the nearest 12-inch bass. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull